you very much. It is, a, it is such a, a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, there was a late evangelist who would always say, whenever I come onto the stage at a standing ovation, I'm tempted to walk back off and then I can go and tell my wife that I left to a standing ovation as well. Um, but as she's here today, I don't think that would fly. It, it, just before I, I start, um, I, I, I don't say that glibly or, or um, just flippantly that I'm excited here to be here today. I, I've been really looking forward to this for a while. And just as I was preparing the material in my heart this week, there's something special uh, that is happening. And I hope you're awake to that. I hope you're aware that, that the Lord is pouring himself in special ways out. And it is exciting. And, uh, and the, I don't know how many, familiar, how many are familiar with the late evangelist Leonard Ravenhill. If you're looking for some real fiery stuff from the 70s, look him up. But he always said, I don't need to spend months getting to know a man. Give me one hour in prayer with him, and I will know that man. And if I can just say, uh, Pastor Stefan, Pastor Vanessa, um, it was such a pleasure to pray with you this morning. Uh, and that, I, I just I get more and more excited as we go through today, where we are calling on the holy name of God, we are raising the name of Christ, and we are believing the Spirit for power. Those are children of God who are ready to receive the direction of God. And I think that's what's going on here today. So um, I'm, I'm just glad to be along for the ride. Um, I, was, I was recently reading in the book of uh, Ezekiel, and, and the first chapter of Ezekiel starts with this glorious vision of the exalted God. And a thought occurred to me as I was reading that. I thought to myself, what on earth was the glory of God doing there? Ezekiel was a priest in a foreign city, separated from his temple, his land, and supposedly his God. He was surrounded in a way like us, by children's sacrifice, by lust and debauchery of the Babylonian Empire. And he must, have been, he must have felt utterly cut off from Yahweh. But it was there, there of all places, that Ezekiel saw the glory of God. And it strikes me. I think the glory of God has a peculiar, um, we, we might say perhaps inconvenient way of showing up in the places we least expect accomplishing things we could never have imagined. And the reason for that is because then and only then we can say it was only God. I too have asked that question. I've, I've said to myself, what on earth is the glory of God doing here? For too many in the church, I think politics is the last place that you would expect to see the glory of God. But God met Ezekiel in his need. And despite where we find ourselves as a nation today, like Ezekiel, I believe we are going to come to thank God for the day we live in as he reveals himself in a peculiar, perhaps inconvenient place and as he accomplishes unimaginable things. You know, I, uh, I've always felt drawn to this place of leadership, a place of, of public speaking and that kind of thing. So uh, liking the sound of my own voice, politics seemed like an obvious place to go. But perhaps the church is just an obvious place, so I dabble in both. It wasn't until I was already in a minister's office. I was uh, part of the, the um, ministerial staff that was advising under John Key's pre um, premiership. And I began to feel God put on my heart to study a master's of theology. And I love the Word of God. I, I grew up overseas under missionary parents, and so I, I, I knew my way around Scripture, but I thought, what on earth am I going to do with a master's of theology? It wasn't a direction I had anticipated at all. And it wasn't until I had already obeyed, it wasn't until I stepped out and was applying myself in that, that I began to discover public theology. This fusion, this, this way of thinking of saying that our faith, the kingdom of God, has every place in the political sphere, in the public sphere, in influencing our nation. And so that's where I stand. And, and I stand kind of uh, in an awkward position. Like you said, Pastor Stefan, not many Christians spend a lot of time considering this. And perhaps you're all too familiar that for those that do, can come away with some weird thinking sometimes. They can come away with this idea that we are called to dominate the unbelieving and to rule with godliness with an iron fist over those who don't agree with us. And, and I'm afraid I don't see that in Scripture. But equally, I think a lot of people can say, well, we shouldn't have anything to do with that, that ungodliness, that worldliness. The kingdom of God is coming one day, and uh, we'll wait for it then. Thank you very much. I'll just live my quiet life. I think there's a balance in between the two. And I pray the Spirit of God would anoint our hearts in this time to walk in that balance. The Gospel of John, 
My favorite book in the Bible opens with a great promise. A promise I think we should incline our ears toward in our day. It says this, the next slide there, John. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. At times, I am tempted to look at the state of our nation and the values we are embracing, and frankly, to despair. But take heart. Darkness has not overcome the light. The darkness will never overcome the light. And let me be clear, because I think I need to clarify a little bit here. The light that John is talking about here, it's not politics. It's not conservatism. It's not capitalism. It's not Trump, my friends. Just to remind you out there, Trump is not the light. There is one light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks in me will never walk in darkness, but will have, and I love this, the light of life. There is great hope for our country because Jesus is our light. And I hope you hear that this morning. Because as I travel around, I travel around just preaching generally and then speaking specifically on politics as well. And one of the things I frequently come across are Christians that are walking in so much discouragement and so much defeat over the cultural direction of our nation. And I ask you, what kind of witness is that to the world around us when we are so fatalistic? Thank God Jesus is coming in a few years because I don't want to hang around here any longer. I'm afraid I don't think that's the message we're supposed to take into the end times. So I want you to stand in hope that the people of God, I believe, are going to be anointed in this nation in a greater way than we have ever known. Because as darkness grows, our opportunities will grow. I hope you are excited for the days we are heading in. And, and I don't want to be glib about that. In the role that I work in and the roles that I've come from, I was the, the senior advisor on the abortion legislation that went through. I was the senior advisor on the euthanasia legislation. I've worked on hate speech laws, which we managed to defeat, thankfully. There are some heavy things going on in our nation. It's not uncommon for me to sit in my office and weep. I'm not trying to be glib about this. But we have a hope that is an anchor for our soul. And I think as Christians, we far too easily forget that often. So I start with this because I want to disavow any accusation that I believe politics is the answer for our society. It is not. However, just as Jesus claimed in John 8 to be the light of the world, he also said in Matthew 5 that as recipients of the Holy Spirit, we also are the light of the world. And I believe that the light of Jesus must be shone in the public square. And we must be wise and humble in the manner that we do that. So effectively, what I'm saying here today is let's shout Jesus from the mountaintops and Jesus in the streets and Jesus over darkness. That's what I'm saying. This is what we do. We grab hold of the kingdom of God. We say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It starts with us loving the name of Jesus. And then we say, your kingdom come. So today... My wife and I are here to encourage the people of God to stand and be counted as among those who will set their hearts on shining the light of Christ in every corner of this nation. And we believe that if the church stands in faith and conviction, speaking boldly for the future of this nation, the greatest days are still ahead of us. Unfortunately, I come across so many Christians who actually say that faith doesn't have anything to say to politics. Too many chefs in that kitchen, they claim. My response is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. And I wonder if we've come from days where we have forgotten our prophetic zeal and we have become an irrelevant social club with neither moral or spiritual authority. Thankfully, we believe in Christ redeeming that. And I believe in the days that we're walking into, we will face greater persecution than we've ever known and Christ will be more exalted than we have seen. And so while Ecclesiastes 10.2, it says the heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool inclines to the left. I'm not here to advocate for a government on the right. It took a while there. (laughs) I'm here to advocate for a righteous government. 
I pray that our story would not be that of Peter denying Jesus before the Sanhedrin in, in John 18, but that of Peter just several chapters later, standing before the Sanhedrin again, testifying to a Christ who changed his life. We must join that very public voice then with a public voice now, one that does not shy away from criticism or unpopularity or controversy. And I encourage you to keep three words in mind as we go through this. Everyone say this after me. Presence, Presence. translation, Translation. and gift. These are three pillars, I call them, of a public theology. Our world rages with contemporary debates. That much is clear. Everyone has an opinion. Every radio station has its morning talkback. Every television station has its breakfast discussion. And seemingly, every millennial appears to have their own blog. Christians do not have a monopoly on strong opinions for where we should be going as a nation. And unlike in ages past, where the church has a right to be heard by nature of its prominence, Christianity today exists in a secular, pluralistic society and is increasingly marginalized. So that means not only does not everyone have an opinion already, but people care less and less about what the church's opinion is. So the question that occurs out of that then is how are we to contribute to contemporary debates? And I believe that our country does not pursue the path it is currently set on because of the weakness of our light. I believe that our country pursues the path it is currently set on because far too much of the light has abdicated its responsibility of shining. For most of us here, we could name 101 things very easily about what is wrong with the direction we are taking as a society. But how many of us are standing up to change that? And I believe there is a great need for the people of God to be stirred from disengaged indifference to rekindle a blazing light in our communities. And this will require much effort and much sacrifice, but we must have a presence at the table. So what does this mean in very practical terms? I know Pastor Stefan is very good at speaking on issues. Are you aware of the taxpayers' union? Are you aware of the free speech union? There were not enough people here aware of the free speech union, so come and talk to me about it afterwards. But if you're concerned with the social calendar in your town, join the Lions Club. If you're concerned with what charities are being given money, join your Rotary. If you're concerned with the teaching in your school, go be selected on the Board of Trustees or join the PTA. If you can write well, start challenging the worthless, vapid principles that have been published in our newspapers and write something that shimmers a little with the light of God. Maybe even join a political party. Oh, he said political in church. A significant way to change the laws that have been made in this country is to change our members of parliament. And you need to be part of the political party to choose who has been selected. It was my great pleasure to walk with about 15 fantastic members of parliament when I was there. Fantastic members of parliament. You say oxymoron, but it's not. They do exist. We just need to stand with them. We need to fight for them. We need to have a voice in this nation. And unfortunately, I think particularly as Kiwis, we're far too disengaged. She'll be right. Frankly, she won't be. But remember this. I'm convinced that culture is not built by the majority. And it is not built top, uh, bottom up. These are the common conceptions of culture that the broad society believes in it and it's built bottom up. It's not. Culture is almost always built top down and by a minority, by a particular set of people. Often it can be very small. I'm talking a couple of hundred people in a nation that have their eyes set on a particular prize. Do you know why transgenderism has become such a prominent issue in our age, in our nation? It's because I'm talking to a couple of hundred people have set their sights on changing the way our nation thinks about it, and they're winning at the moment. It's because the church is disengaged. We need to understand that the kingdom of God is about changing today. It is not just fire insurance for one day when we go. It is that. Praise the Lord, a king is coming, and we will reign under him one day. We're not called to reign with an iron scepter today, but we're called to shine a light today. I hope this is touching something in your spirits. Every place that you stand in, you are called to shine a light. My parents worked as missionaries for 20 years in rural Mozambique. I'm going to tell you a few stories about that shortly. But the reason they went is because they understood that they may not be the best missionaries. They weren't. But if they didn't go, 
who would? They're not the best preachers, but if they didn't speak, who would? You see, it was Edmund Burke, the conservative statesman from the UK, who said, nobody makes a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. And there is something very Christian in my mind about taking the little that we have. It's that one silver coin that we have to offer the Lord. And we trust Christ that he will do something with the little we have to offer because no one makes a bigger mistake than they who do nothing because they can only do a little. Passivity is not an option for the children of God who, motivated by the example of Christ, seek first the kingdom, asking that it would be established in every part of our nation. And so if we are to bring the light of life into to contemporary debates, we must be at the table. And when we are there, we must speak intelligibly. Which brings me to my second point. The first point was presence. Does anyone remember the second point? Translation. Very good. We, we're listening today. That's great. Because of our increasingly diminished position within society, we must be increasingly aware of the language we use. Hear me carefully when I say that. That is not to say we do not speak a strong message, but it is to say that we do not speak a message that arrogantly appeals to the legitimacy of our own values without humble reference to those who we are talking with. As more and more of our nation has virtually no understanding of the gospel, no understanding of the values that it's built on, they will not understand our sermons. In fact, our sermons will sound increasingly radical to them, and they will be increasingly offended by them. And that's okay. I'm not saying we tone down our sermons, but we must, when we're engaging in the public sphere, speak intelligibly. And that's exactly what Paul does in Athens. We see in Acts 17, when he considered the terms of reference that were common to the Greeks of that time, as they sought to engage the raging questions of their day. Paul did not demand that they accept the authority of the Bible or validity of his claims concerning Christ. But he reasoned with them in their own terms with reference to their own gods. He was using language that was intelligible to them. We must speak in terms that the world can receive, and that requires humility. I believe that there is nothing more powerful than the Word of God. I love the blessing that we receive in Scripture. But my mom often challenges me. I believe the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides thought and intention. But she says to me, Jonathan, are you using that Scripture as a scalpel? to carefully divide between thought and intention? Are you just using it as a club to beat people around with? I love my mom. She often has a hard word for me. I wonder if that strikes with any of you. I often go into churches, and to be honest, they're usually pretty obvious. I think every church has a few people that love using the, club, the word of God as a club. They often come up to me at the end, and they criticize my use of one scripture or another. And I wonder if they're really capturing the essence of what Scripture is trying to tell us. Let's not be a people arrogantly consumed in our own thought knowledge. Let's use this Word of God carefully, passionately. But we need to understand it can be destructive as well. One theologian writes, The Word of God has transforming power only as it intersects with our personal and broader collective stories and history as our community and nation. Se eu falo em português, tem aqui alguém que pode me entender. Talvez um brasileiro. If I speak in Portuguese, can anyone here understand me? Usually there's someone from Brazil here, but uh, maybe not today. I could, I could preach the most anointed message. I could, I could be poured out on the Spirit by, of, of God, but if I did not use language that you understand, what value would that be? You see, when the Spirit fell in Jerusalem, at Pentecost in Acts 2, the disciples were anointed to speak the languages of those that surrounded them. And this, it says, was a sign of the power of God. I believe in heavenly languages, but they weren't speaking in heavenly languages that day. They were speaking in the languages of men. And I believe God wants to anoint us to speak the language of those that surround us, that the word of God would pierce their hearts. Let us be humble and use our words winsomely, not divisively. If we are to bring a theological perspective into contemporary debates, we must be at the table and we must speak intelligibly so others can receive it. And finally, we had presence, we had translation, and we had gift. In order to be a light in the public sphere, drawing upon the insights of Christian faith, we offer their contribution as a gift to the world. 
Because as Christ said, freely we have received. Freely we must give. James tells us that every good gift comes from above, from the Father of light. That light that shines in us, that we shine into the world, it is not our own. It did not start with us. And were it not for the grace of God, my friends, our lives would have no light to shine into the darkness of the world that surrounds us. We are prisoners, therefore. This is the word that that Paul uses. We are slaves of grace. We offer this gift to a secular world, humbly, as those who have received a gift because we know the joy of renouncing the sinful ways of man and embracing the righteousness of Christ. This teaching that Christians have a gift to offer to a secular world, it flies in the, ta- in the face of, of those on both sides. It flies in the face of morality teaching, which states that being a Christian is about following the Ten Commandments. It refutes the ambiguous, relativistic acceptance of contradictory worldviews as well. It means we come humbly, but we also claim to have something of substance. It undermines a judgmental, pharisaical spirit which lords our superior righteousness over the world. Again, I think far too often this has been a spirit that has touched those who are Christians who are involved in politics, in arrogance that is very far from the Spirit of God. Because we need to stay humble in this fight because we remember what C.S. Lewis wrote. Christ did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. Our message is to bring light and light into our nation. We are not the author of life, but we are called to be his conduits. So I ask you, are you, stand, are you at the table? Are you speaking in ways that others can understand? And finally, is your contribution seen by those around us as a gift? You know, I think the world will seek out the Christian perspective in time to come as they understand we have something worth offering. We see this time and time again in history. When I did my master's thesis, one of the things I looked at was the way the Christian message has stood in politics over time. And as darkness grows, as governments push Christians out, they become sought after. I don't know if you know about the Desert Fathers. In the middle of the Arabian Desert, people would leave Rome to go and find them because they had a message worth sharing. And thankfully, we don't have to go that far today, but I wonder on your Facebook feeds, in your workplace tea rooms, at our social groups, is your speech and are our lives gracious and humble? Are they shining the light of redemption into a needy world or are we judgmental, arrogant, and angry? I pray that we would be bearers of the gift of good news, instruments of peace. And in that time, we must be bold. We must be willing to challenge thoughts. We do it in a humble way though. Because I think often Christians can take from this, well, let's be nice. Let's be pleasant and people will like us and then they won't come after us. That's not going to cut it. We need to be bold. We need to accept that we will stand as insult and offense in this world, but that we will be a light as we do that. You know, this has been the message from the beginning. This has been the calling of Christ from the beginning. I was was reflecting on the, the incredible symbol that the cross is recently. I was reflecting on those that stood at its feet as Christ was crucified. And a thought occurred to me, and I wrote this down. And there are different ways. Each one of them had sacrificed to be there on that day. Some had given all they had to come to this point. In a brief series of hours, it had all been seized from them, taken. Through the years, they had each set themselves on the path that had brought them together at this hill. They had resolutely responded to the call of God that resounded in their hearts as the one called teacher called them each by name. But none of them thought that it could ever end here. How could this be? He who had been the fulfillment of their greatest hopes, the defender against their darkest fears, the bearer of their highest dreams, he it was now that cried out before them, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? He who had inaugurated the kingdom of heaven in their midst, now dead. They had put their hopes, their futures, their dreams, their social standings and livelihoods on the line in the hands of the cursed man who now hung from a Roman tree. The one who had defied death and blindness and brokenness now broke before them. The source of power, powerless 
the son of life dead. And the crowds that surrounded them, they lifted their voices now, did not seem so different from those that had joyously celebrated with palm leaves several days before. But now they did not sing Hosanna. Zion, the eternal city of David, had turned against their king, had used his own holy law to condemn him and had handed him over to die. And at the foot of the cross, a handful of women gathered, weeping bitterly. Each had felt him reach into their hearts and touch them in a different way, but together they had come to know him as the promised one, their hope, the Messiah. And with them stood a single young man, still a boy really, John, the one Jesus loved. All others had fled, and could you blame them? In the face face of such betrayal, in the face of complete defeat, without hope, what name, what cause were they still to stand for? And so unable to stand, John brokenheartedly fell at the foot of the cross, knowing a deeper darkness, a greater sorrow, a heavier burden than perhaps any of us have ever known as his Lord died. And John stayed there a long time. His world had died with his Lord, and he simply didn't know what to do. Yet as he knelt, devastated at the foot of the cross, a phrase which the teacher had said several hours earlier swirled in his mind. It seemed as if the cross and the wind and all that surrounded him shouted the words that he had heard in a whisper. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And creation itself grew in crescendo as life and victory resounded forth from the cross on which a dead man lay. What hope, what victory exists for one laid in a tomb? And over the hours and days that followed, this dichotomy, this contradiction terrorized John's soul as the promise that those who hope in him will never die and the claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life fell vanquished at the foot of the means of his death. The exhaustion of his grief would seduce John into restless sleep and he would awake too terrified to hope that it had all been the darkest of nightmares. But the cross still stood on that hill, the purported symbol of ultimate defeat. And he looked out at this defiant, mocking symbol early on the third morning as the stillness of day emerged. And then Mary broke through his deafening grief and told him that the Lord's stone had been rolled away. And he ran to the tomb, but stricken with consuming fear of daring to hope, he didn't enter until Peter joined him. And then they believed. And when the Lord later revealed himself to the twelve, he said to Thomas, You believe because you have seen, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet still believe. Blessed are they who, though death seems to mock them, though darkness seems to win, though faith and hope are dashed, still believe that he has overcome the world. Blessed are those with a peace beyond an understanding who look at the cross and who fall at its feet and hear its reverberating chorus of victory, a symbol of the Lord of life. Blessed are those who take heart in the face of trials and troubles of many kind. Because as he has declared, it is finished. In response to creation's chorus that he has overcome, we too join in. The words of the hymnist come to mind when we declare, crown him the Lord of life, who triumphs over the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die. 
There is great hope for us, my friends. There is always great hope for us. In this world, we will have many troubles, but take heart. He has overcome the world. And while this is certainly not the summation or a complete end of a comprehensive political theology, it must be its foundation. This is where we must start. And so I encourage you today, in the face of deadly legislation and toxic self-promotion and divisive politicking, let us tune into the chorus of the cross claiming his ultimate victory. I pray that in the name of the Lord of life, we would speak life to this nation. That is the heart's cry that the Lord has placed within me, that the people of God would capture hold of what he has done, what he is still doing, and the promises that are still for us. Do you know the miracle working power of God in your life? Speak that to your neighbors. Speak that to the society that surrounds us. I am blessed to stand in a unique place where I frequently will make people very uncomfortable by talking about Christ, both in the church and outside the church. You know, we seem to have this acceptance of of Māori, Waiata, and Karakia, and I'm all for that. But sometimes I just do it in English, and there's there's a different feeling around that. But let's challenge our nation with the name of God. You know, it makes me think of a number of the people that I'm blessed to work with in Mozambique. My wife and I still help lead uh, an organization in Mozambique. And I was recently over there. I spent uh, two weeks in Europe recently for my work with the Free Speech Union. And then I spent two weeks in Mozambique speaking at a leadership conference. And I want to quickly share just a few stories from them that encouraged me. These are some of the leaders that we're blessed to work with. John, if we just go on to that next slide there. This is uh, what my mother and I look like when we arrive in the middle of absolute nowhere. My mother is an incredible woman. She's of a, or she probably wouldn't want me to tell you how old she is, but um, she's of an age where she's soon going to be paid by the government for being that age. Um, and after several hours on a 50cc motorbike into the jungle, I feel like I can barely get off the bike to walk. I don't know how she does it. Um, if we just go on to the next slide there, John, this man here, His name is Peter, or Pedro, as we call him in in Portuguese. The next slide is him with his wife. Pedro and Laurinda, his wife, know what it is to stand on the front line of the kingdom of God, to arise and shine into the darkness of the hearts and minds who don't know Christ. I think they know better than almost anyone else I've ever met, because to this day, Pedro is one of the senior leaders in the ministry in Mozambique, but his mother-in-law, Laurinda's mother is a witch doctor. And by that, I don't mean she plays with crystals and read horoscopes. I mean, through the power of darkness, she communicates with the dead. She performs seances. She tries to curse the people of God. And since the moment Pedro and Laurinda were the first in their villages to abandon animism and spirit worship, she has been hellbent, literally, on trying to break their marriage apart. For decades, Laurinda's family has worked to divide her from her husband and their God to bring her back to witchcraft. Just a few weeks ago, before we arrived in Mozambique, Pedro's in-laws went and destroyed their mashamba, their food garden, simply because if they had their lives hard enough, they believed they would eventually be able to divide them. And I hope you understand, in a subsistence culture like in Mozambique, one of the poorest nations in the world, they, are, they grow what they eat. You destroy their year's worth of food. They have no food for a year. In the desperate poverty and need that these guys experience, it wasn't just the storm, the cyclone that had come through now. It was their own family that had destroyed their sustenance. And for any of us that were raised in a Christian family, I can't for a moment imagine what it is to follow Christ and remain faithful to him under that kind of opposition and pressure. But even for those of you perhaps who have come to faith out of an unsaved family, I don't think we appreciate the impact that the gospel and the kingdom of God has had in our nation, which means that even though we may not have known it personally, so much of our culture and so many of our values have still been changed, have been at least. The direction we are quickly pursuing now is so quickly disregarding this heritage that we've received. I believe that we will see more and more blatant darkness that would perhaps 
not be so different from the seances of Laurinda's mother. But during this time, as we are called to stand in increasing darkness, just like Laurinda and Pedro, our eyes must not be on the darkness. Our eyes must not be on what the devil's plans are for our nation. I'm more interested in what it means to be the people of God. In a, times like, in a time like this. I'm more interested in whether we're awake and whether we know how to arise and to shine. I want to know what the plan of God for blessing and deliverance and healing and restoration and provision still are as the people of God keep their eyes fixed on Him. You see, that's the only way Pedro and Laurinda have ever been able to endure in such an oppositional environment. It's by keeping their eyes fixed on Christ. You know, I think we often think Christ was always surrounded by great crowds hearing his teaching, and that was often true. But at times, he would frankly say the wrong thing. And his disciples would say, I I just don't know why you needed to say that. And they would leave him. We see this in John 6. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. A remarkable miracle that reveals to this enormous crowd. I've never preached to 5,000. Have you preached to 5,000? It's a big crowd. It reveals that he's a miracle worker. He, makes, he had to go and make some silly comment about being the bread of life. And those who were listening didn't, didn't like that. Lots were interested in the physical bread. Lots were interested in what Christ could give them, what Christ could provide for them. But they weren't so interested in eating of the spiritual bread. They weren't so interested in receiving him as Christ. And as the crowd disappears, Jesus turns to his 12 disciples And he says to them, do you want to go away as well? And Peter turns to him and says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Just like Simon Peter who walked with Jesus, this Peter, Pedro in Mozambique, knows that the commands of Christ are costly. But where else would we go? He has the words of eternal life. And my friends, I don't want us to be glib about this. The victory of Christ still comes through darkness. It still comes through defeat sometimes. It still comes through suffering. It still comes through sacrifice. But there is a joy and a hope that holds us. There are times when in the role that I have, I want to throw in the towel in the work that I do. When I want to sit down and shine a little bit less. I went through a season like that a few years ago. My wife and I went and bought a vineyard. We own a vineyard in in the Wairarapa as well. And I thought, I'm just going to take care of my vineyard. I'm going to stand here and prune my vines and be a contemplative monk. They, They used to exist. I'm sure I could still do that. But God has a calling on my life. God has a calling on your life. I hope you know what it is. And I hope you're you're pursuing it. Because each one of us are not just called to salvation. We will be called to give an account for how we have lived our lives before the Lord. There are two judgments. The first of whether we have called on the name of Christ, and I hope you have. But for those of us who have called on the name of Christ, we will one day have to give an account. And if you have not been listening to the Spirit, if you have not been pursuing the call of God on your life, and if you have not been shining as a light, Christ will not have kind words for you on that day. So my friends, even as we stand in increasingly dark times, I pray that we would not lose heart. Do not sink into obscurity. Remember that we have been given the words of eternal life. I also want to, the next slide is a young man called Mercio, one of the first uh, young leaders we've been able to raise up. And what he reminds me of is that God's purposes are never just for one generation. Quite often we see a move of God that touches one generation and fizzled out. And what My parents and my wife and I are proclaiming over the ministry in Mozambique that it is not just for one generation. The kingdom of God comes and takes root and it endures and it gets stronger. You know, I'm just the opening act. You should see the anointing God's going to put on my son. You should see what God has planned for your children as you stand and shine. So I'm excited by mercy, a young man who gives us such encouragement as we see a second generation standing up. Mesio Teller Ministries, which is the ministry that we run, is a holistic ministry. So we say it's not just about preaching a faith that saves, but not caring about the physical needs as well. James talks a lot about that. And so it's always been about medical missions, church planting, and mercy ministries. Mercio helps run the mercy ministries. And in a society with no social welfare, 
The church is often the difference between life and death, literally, for the very neediest and the poorest. And there are several dozen individuals who no one else will care for and who no one else wants to know that Mercio supports. One is an old woman, the next slide there, who has been totally abandoned by her family. When I say she is nothing, this isn't her house. She's not sitting on someone, her own dirt floor. She doesn't even have a dirt floor. That's someone else's dirt floor. When we say she is nothing, this isn't an area that's already in abject poverty by our standards. She has nothing. And by, but her poverty is far greater than just that. More than having nothing, she has no one. She has been totally abandoned, and she lives literally in the middle of nowhere in the jungle, going months and months without seeing anyone else. And while her lack of possessions may seem foreign to us, maybe some of us are now thinking about her loneliness. Maybe that's something our society can relate to. When Mercio became aware of her need and began walking hours to go and see her, he goes on foot. Grace and I were able to uh, help provide three motorbikes for the leaders there as they travel many, many uh, kilometers to different villages. We raced for three, but there's four leaders. So where Mercio goes, he goes on foot. And I don't know if you've seen someone who's lived their entire life barefoot. I don't know if you, you can picture those feet. Gnarly feet. Dirty feet. Beautiful feet. How beautiful are those feet that bring good news to this woman. He began visiting this old woman and caring for her. Old and abandoned, she wasn't able to till her own food garden. And so she lived literally on what she could forage in the jungle. And Mercio got a couple of local youth groups together, borrowed some land from the church, and planted and tended a garden for her. And every time the youth group got together, he said, we don't do this mahala. Mahala is a makua word. It's actually the name of my wife in makua. It means grace. He's saying in this context, we don't do this for free. Every time he gets together, he says, we're not doing this mahala. God will cover our bill. And on one of his most recent visits, Mercio was speaking with this old granny. And she said, you haven't forgotten me. Everyone else has forgotten me. Everyone else has abandoned me. Thank you for what you are giving me. Thank you for what you've done. But thank you most of all for just talking with me and caring and remembering that I'm here. And as I said earlier, it's not uncommon for me to find myself crying in my office as, as I work more and more deeply in the direction that our society is taking. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, Bethlehem College issue that has been raging over the past couple of weeks. I've been uh, one of the key spokespersons on that. And my team and I have been under a lot of pressure from people who hate our message. And it's sacrifice. It's hard. But what the hardest thing is to see what will be the fruit of the path that we are pursuing. The darkness and the brokenness that are being invited into people's lives. And I see the loneliness and the need that God's ways help us avoid. And my heart is heavy for the cost of abandoning God. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, I am resolute that as the darkness gets darker, our light will shine brighter. As we arise as we are a people that awake despite the night falling, as we are ready to do the work of our master, I pray that the Lord would give us eyes for those who are forgotten, for those who are alone. You see, while the church is opposed and attack more and more, there will also be more opportunities than ever before for the power of the Holy Spirit to flow through us as we prophetically speak. The power of God is still for his people. This still means good news to the poor. It still means freedom for the prisoner. It still means recovery of slight, sight for the blind. And it means that the oppressed will be set free. It means for those who are alone, abandoned, and forgotten, the Lord still remembers their names. And he is calling us as a people to stand up and be his light, to be his arms and his feet. I hope you're excited about the days we live in church. And I wrestle with the hardness of my heart I wrestle with the lack of love for God that exists in my life. And that is why I lose hope. That is why I want to sink back. Because I let my eyes drift off Christ. But the Lord's love for me never grows weak. The Lord's love for you is constant. And the Lord has never forgotten you. He has never abandoned you. If you will allow his love, his faithfulness, and his mercy to accompany you, you will have more than you need. 
according to his riches and glory to arise and to shine in this day. Such is the power, such are the promises for those who believe. But my concern is that for some of those here today, perhaps that's the problem. Perhaps the problem is the Lord doesn't forget. And you say, the Lord may not have forgotten me, and there's the issue. He hasn't forgotten who I really am. He hasn't forgotten what I've really done. You know, the most offensive, blasphemous belief of all is one that I think we frequently indulge in church. Somehow we believe it's exalting of God to consider us too far gone from His grace. We believe that God isn't big enough to deal with what I've done, to deal with where I've been, to deal with who I really am. I tell you today, it is not a Christ-exalting doctrine to declare yourself beyond His power. A Christ-exalting doctrine is to say, yes, I am a lost sinner without Him, but His grace reaches even to me. His mercy is more. It is sufficient to cover even where I've gone, even who I've been. That is the power of my Christ. It is not enough to say that you're too far gone. You're not. It's not just for those here today who struggle with believing this. The last quick story I want to share with you of the leaders who came to the leadership conference that I ran several weeks ago. They struggle with this belief too. We held a seminar for the network of churches where they could send their senior leaders and many walked up to 50 kilometers to get there for five sessions of teaching because they're so hungry for the word of God. But they come fallen. They come broken. They come believing but also doubting. They come having messed up. Perhaps like us here today. They come feeling like a fraud. They come not daring to believe that the promises of love and life and faithfulness are really for them. They come tired from the fight. They come weary. They come weak. And in response to this, though they may not feel like it, in the opening praise and worship time, they sing a song that says this. Meu passado, Jesus já sabe. E agora quero começar de novo. The past, the Lord already knows it. And now I want to start again. It's a simple song, but a powerful one, because one of the greatest lies that the devil will try and sow in your life and make you believe is that you've had your chance, that you were given your shot, and that you blew it. And so maybe that makes you feel like the saving grace of Christ can't really still be for you. Or even for others, for me, it may mean I believe that God can save me, but he can't use me. I still have to wear my mistakes, and I have to wear my doubts. I may be saved, but my yesterdays mean my arising and my shining will just be a little bit less bright, a little bit less conspicuous than anyone else's. And I believe that Jesus says to you this morning, your past, I already know it. And today, this morning, this moment, I'm inviting you to start anew. Not just for one last time. You can start again as many times as you want. Just don't stop coming to me. You know, it's not just at New Year where we get to say, I'm going to read the Bible, the whole Bible. Today, I'm going to read it every day. And by the second week of January, we realize we're not going to do that again this year. We get to start again. You don't have to wait till January. It's not just Sundays. This week's going to be different. And then Monday comes along as you realize it might not be. You can start again on a Monday. Not just in the morning. Today's going to be different. I'm going to do it better today. You can start again at midday. You can start again moment by moment. One of the greatest lies of the devil is that you've had your chance and it's not true. You get to start again. Keep coming to Christ. Keep falling on his grace. Keep moving forward and shining his light. I want to play just a very brief audio clip for you. And as this plays, I wonder if in your hearts you want to start again this morning. Maybe you want to respond to this message, not just as someone who's hearing it for the first time. If you don't know Christ, this message is for you. But I think many people here do know Christ. This message is still for you. One of the great pleasures of my life, one of the the greatest honors I have is to get to travel around and pray over the people of God. Not because I have any power, 
Not because I'm so special, but because there is power when the people of God stand together and say we're going to hold God to his promises. We're going to come back to his grace and we're going to start anew. So as we play this uh, clip here, John, I wonder if you want to just listen to the Spirit for a second and see what he's calling you to. past, Jesus already knows it. And now I want to start again. So I wonder if the worship band can come and join me on stage again. And as we come to a close, I want to pray a prayer of you. So I wonder if you would all stand up to receive this prayer. To prove my ecumenical roots, I'm praying a Franciscan prayer of you too. So um, hopefully no one bursts into flame at the Catholic prayer being read. And as the worship team starts playing again, I wonder if we could um, play Shout It From The Mountaintops, that song again. If you feel like you want to start anew, take this opportunity and come and respond to the Lord. Put your body in a place where you want your spirit to be. If you want to stand and shine a light, respond to God in this time. And I know that there are elders and the pastors here. It would be my privilege to get to pray with you. But as we close... Pray that God would bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships, so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world, so that we can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to our children and to the poor. Amen. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.